marrying biology and neuroscience with with hardcore electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science to to actually say yes, these circuits in the spinal cord, if we imitate them as faithfully as we can, then they give rise to a certain type of behavior. You know, those behaviors can help us make better machines, better robots. But on the other hand, they can help us understand why, say, people with Parkinson's disease or people after stroke uh, have spasticity and have the ability to move smoothly and things like that. Engineering, you could argue, is entering a very exciting era where you combine engineering with chemistry and we got the Industrial Revolution. You combine engineering with physics and we got the Information Revolution and we also, you know, was a big part of the Industrial Revolution and uh, being able to manufacture materials and create energy and all of that. And now it's actually biology's turn. Here you see a wooden model of it, and here I have a general high-level CAD design. It's tendon-driven uh, versus uh, uh, like a regular robot that has uh, motors at every joint. This one is going to have tendons or strings attached at each limb, and the motors are going to be at the top. The motors will pull and on the the limb in different directions and will cause it to move. To try to imitate the circuitry that we have in the spinal cord, you know, when you get tapped on, on your knee when you go to the pediatrician, you know, you, your leg moves and people say, oh, that's good. Well, what's happening there? Well, what's happening there is that you get a tendon stretch that's very brief from the, from the tapping and that is sensed at the muscle that's sent to the spinal cord and then the spinal cord regulates that signal and then sends it to the neurons that control your muscles and then your muscles contract. This is called the stretch reflex. We're, we're at the brink of very exciting changes where you combine engineering, mathematics and biology. And we're just beginning to understand how we can apply mathematical rigor to our thinking about complex biology. So one of the things that we're doing is we are, in a sense, recapitulating what um, Sherrington said. So he was saying, hey, this regulation of reflexes is the foundation for behavior. That muscle tone as we know it, how we keep our posture, but also disabilities like uh, spasticity and dystonias and uh, you know inability to move properly. Those come from the disruptions in how the brain and the spinal cord regulate these reflexes. So neuroscience is a huge field, and of course there's work in a variety of areas. And one of the projects that we're specifically uh, pursuing is to say, okay, what can the reflexes, as we know them in the spinal cord, what can they provide in terms of allowing us to create uh, quadrupeds? Or, or bipedal robots. Just one example of, of the projects that are our community, which is, you could call computational neuroscience, you could call this community uh, motor control or neurophysiology or neurorehabilitation. What this community is now doing worldwide, uh, which is dependent on this very uh, seamless interaction and combination of mathematics and biology. Now, don't let anybody tell you that if you like math, you should have nothing to do with biology, or that if you like biology, you cannot apply that mathematics to, to your understanding, right? This is going to be a very exciting era where mathematics and engineering and biology and, and medicine are going to be combined, um, and I think to improve the quality of life of millions of people.